Welcome pre-cal students to the review sheet. Uh, all of these pages here that you can see and all of these numbers. Let's go ahead and get started uh, with the review sheet for today. Let's see how we do. Here we go. Uh, numbers 1 through 41. We're going to be... Um, let me grab my lesson plan book here real quick. Students, numbers 1 through 41. We're going to be verifying trig identity. So here we go. Let's jump into this with tons of enthusiasm and tons of excitement. Here we go. Well, sine t can be put over 1 and cosecant, co, cosecant that's good, psycho, uh, cosecant t is the same thing as 1 over sine. Okay. So you really have sine over 1 times 1 over sine. Of course, your sines cancel. And if your sines cancel, uh, you would have 1 over 1, which equals 1. There we go. Not too difficult, okay? All right, let's take a look here at number 5. Okay, on number 5, you see you see a lot of squared functions, cosine squared, sine squared, sine squared. So right away, I'm thinking Pythagorean identities, uh, which is sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. And so, with that in mind, hopefully you can read that, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So, I'm thinking right here for my 1, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to substitute sine squared plus cosine squared, and then bring down my minus 2 sine squared. So, for this 1 right here, I took it out, and I put this right here. Now, look for like terms you have 1 sine squared minus 2 sine squared. So that's going to be cosine squared minus 1 or just sine squared. If you want to put a, a 1 in front of it right here, it's totally fine. You don't have to. And look, that totally matches this side over here. Okay, moving on to number nine. Okay, remember remember it's every other odd, every other odd. So 1, 5, 9. And wow, let's see what we got here. Um, first of all, when I look at this, one of the first things I think of is maybe factoring. Let me tell you why I think of that, students. I'm seeing a sine to the fourth and a cosine to the fourth, and I don't know many trig identities that have a fourth power. So, and again, remember, it's trial and error, and not only that, uh, you guys are seeing me pause the video every time I go to a new problem. That's because I go to a new problem and I pause it and I work it out. So please don't think that I'm getting these right on my first try. I have to do trial and error just like you do, okay? But what I realized is if I factor out a sine squared, I'm just going to use x, so I'm not using all these fancy little uh, unknown variables here, but if I pull out a sine squared, I'm left with 1 minus sine squared, okay? Now, um, let's see here. N what I notice next, students, is that I really need to get into this equation um, some cosines, okay? I mean, look, this whole side over here is sines, and this side over here is cosines. So, Mr. Hart, what if you, uh, what if you factored this side over here? Well, that'd be fine. But then you'd have to get some signs worked in because this sign over here, this sign over here is sine. Either way it would have worked. But I chose to factor the left side first. So now I've got to get some cosines worked in here. Now for sine squared, sine squared, think about it guys, sine squared is the same thing as 1 minus cosine squared. Remember, let's go over here. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So if you bring the cosine squared over, it's 1 minus cosine squared. Okay, now. 1 minus sine squared will bring the sine squared over and make it a negative sine squared and you're left with cosine squared. So for 1 minus sine squared I'm gonna put cosine squared. Okay? So for this I put this, for this I put this. Uh, notice I'm not just putting steps up here. I'm trying to tell you why. I told you why I factored because I had a fourth power which is not gonna be too helpful and then I told you I looked on the right side and I saw that I had a bunch of cosines, so I realized I had to make some substitutions to get rid of these sines and get some cosines over here. Now having done that, uh, if you take this cosine squared and multiply it through, you will get cosine squared minus cosine to the fourth x, which is exactly what we have over here. Alright, moving on to number 11. 
Now remember, I've taught you guys in the past, you can take sometimes a fraction like this and split it up into two terms. But in my opinion, it's a million times easier to take two terms like this and combine them into one term. So I'm going to try that first. Now one of the best ways to combine two terms is to make them fractions and then get a common denominator and then combine them. So cosecant is the same thing as 1 over sine t. And sine, of course, is the same thing as, let's see here, I'm trying to look at what we need here. Cosecant is sine, uh, and sine would be the same thing as 1 over cosecant. And now, students, the reason that we've written these two fractions is next we want to get a common denominator and put these two fractions together. So let's take a look at this. I'm going to multiply this fraction here by cosecant over cosecant to give me a, a denominator of cosecant and sine. I'm going to multiply this fraction here by sine over sine to give me the same denominator. So cosecant times 1 is cosecant t over cosecant times sine would be cosecant t sine t minus 1 times sine is sine t cosecant times sine t would be cosecant t sine t. Please don't get discouraged students. I know this is not e uh, easy to think of on all these on your own, but listen, um, again, we just, we're looking at fundamentals here. When you have two terms, you want to put them together. And, and the best way to do that is to get a common denominator and then put those two fractions together. For example, now that I have a common denominator of cosecant and sine, I'm going to go ahead and put these two fractions together. So cosecant t minus sine t all over my common denominator. Now I'm going to go ahead and erase some stuff just to get some space here. So um, pause the video if you need to. I'm going to erase all this up here. Okay. Now, what I've done so far successfully is I've taken two terms right here and I've written them as one term in a fraction. Now what I have to do is look over here at the left side and say to myself, okay self, what am I going to do here to make this look like this? And I'm not seeing any cotangents right here. I need some cotangents. So I'm thinking, okay, what can I do here um, to get a cotangent up here in the top? Then it dawns on me, hold it, I have a trig, a Pythagorean identity that says 1 plus cotangent 1 plus cotangent squared equals cosecant squared. So I'm thinking, hold on, if I can get a cosecant up here maybe and, and then multiply it through the top, that'll give me a cosecant squared. Now how could I do that? Well look, I notice I've got a sign here in the denominator, okay, right here, a sign. So what? You just got to think outside the box, guys. It's so hard to do. I know that. But watch this. Now watch this. Okay. Now what I did, students, is I took this sign that was written down here in the bottom, and I just put one, one over sign over here. I didn't change anything. Look. 1 times this top right here will give me the same numerator. And sine times cosecant gives me the same denominator. So the sine was here, and I just put it under 1 over here. I'm multiplying the two fractions. If I were to multiply these two fractions back together, I would get my original fraction right here that I started with. Okay, now watch this. Now, 1 over sine is the same thing as cosecant over 1. Think about that. Sine and cosecant are co-function identities. So if I have 1 over sine, that's the same thing as cosecant. So now instead of having 1 over sine, I have cosecant over 1. Now I can take this cosecant and multiply it through and I get cosecant squared t minus cosecant t sine t. Mr. Arrow, I've never thought to have to have done that. I understand that. And it just takes practice. It, it really does, guys. Okay, just a lot of practice. Now, don't forget why you put cosecant squared up here. Cosecant squared equals 1 plus cotangent squared. So for cosecant squared, I'm now going to put 1 plus cotangent squared. Okay? Because look right here, students, 
cosecant squared equals 1 plus cotangent squared. Now, think outside the box. Look what you want to have up here. You just want to have cotangent. You've got a lot of stuff. Your, your denominator is great. You want a cosecant at the bottom, and you have a cosecant right here. You're totally fine. But in the numerator, you just want to have cotangent squared. So I have a positive 1 here. I look over here. I'm like, wait a second. Cosecant times sine. Cosecant times sine. Look at this. Cosecant over 1 times, what is sine? Sine is 1 over cosecant, guys. So when I have cosecant times sine, I really have cosecant times 1 over cosecant, right? I mean, sine is 1 over cosecant. So these cancel. It's 1. So this whole expression right here, cosecant times sine, is just 1. So I really have minus 1. So look what I have. I have 1 plus cotangent squared minus 1. Well, 1 minus 1, if you combine this term here and this term here, you get 0. 1 minus 1 is 0, so they're gone. So this term here cancels with this term here, and you're left with cotangent squared over cosecant t, which is exactly what you want. Okay, that was a tough one. All right. Okay, moving on to number 17. Okay, students, on number 17, we're going to try to do it a little differently. In the past, every single time we've come across a problem where we've had uh, one term on one side and two terms on the other, we've always taken the two terms and tried to put those together and make it one term, which is fine. But I'm going to show you that sometimes you can do it the other way, okay? Just a little experiment to show you that you can do it quite often either way. And sometimes uh, taking one term like this and splitting up into two might be a little bit easier, okay? So... We're going to do it a little differently this time, just so you can see a little different style, okay? So here we go. Uh, 1 over secant tangent x. Well, I'm going to take this fraction right here. Remember, my goal is to split this fraction up so that it becomes two terms. So I'm going to put 1 over secant times 1 over tangent. That's okay. If I were to multiply these two fractions back together right here, I would get my original fraction. Now, 1 over secant is... Uh, cosine times uh, 1 over tangent is cotangent. All right, so there we go. Now, let's take a look at this for a second here and think about this. Our goal is to get two terms. And re listen to me carefully, students, when I say this. The only way to take an expression like this and split it up into two terms is usually, not always, but usually, to get two terms in the numerator. Something like this. I'm going to make this up. x plus y over 5. You could then split that up into x over 5 plus uh, y over 5. Thus, you would have two terms. So it's very helpful to get two terms in the numerator if you want to make this become two terms. And usually, you want one term in the denominator. So we've got a little bit of work to do, but really, if you'll think about it, it's not that difficult. See your cotangent right here? If I say cosine x over 1 times, now remember, cotangent is cosine over sine. Now, that's a big help. Here's why. Watch this. If I multiply these together, look what I get. I get cosine squared. And you're like, okay. Well, that's, that's a big deal because remember, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So if I have cosine squared now, cosine squared is 1 minus sine squared. So for my numerator right now, my numerator right here for cosine squared, I can put 1 minus sine squared over sine. Now why is that a big deal, Mr. Earhart? Because remember what I said a second ago, if you have, if you have something like x plus y over 5, you can split that up into two terms, x over 5 plus y over 5. So let's apply that right here, guys. Look, we have two terms over one term. So we're going to say 1 over sine x minus, because there's a minus sign right here, so minus sine squared over sine. Okay? And now look, we're pretty much home free. I mean, 1, let's go up this way now. 1 over sine is cosecant minus and sine squared over sine just reduce. Take a sine away from both of them and you're left with cosecant x minus 
sine x. So there we go. That's what it's supposed. To, that's what it's supposed to equal. Now, students, listen. I know I've taught you that it's easier to take two terms at the beginning and make it into one term, and that'll work. In this case here, I thought we'd try it the other way and just kind of see what happened, okay? And it worked pretty well. Just remember, anytime you're trying to take one expression and split it up into two, more than likely, you're going to have to write a fraction like this fraction here, in which you had two terms up top and one on the bottom, and then split that up into two terms from there. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next problem, uh, number 19. Okay, students, on this problem here, um, it's going to be really difficult to take a tangent right here and, as you can tell, expand that into a bunch of ter two terms with a lot of exp a lot of um, trig functions in each, in each term. That's going to be difficult to do. So I am going to go back to my old method here where I take this side over here and try to rewrite it so that I have it down to one term. Now, for me, I don't know. I mean, for me, it was just kind of common sense. I see a sign and a sine right here on each term. So I factored out a sine. That's the first thing I did. And if I did that correctly, I'm left with cosine x plus sine squared x secant x. Okay? Now, uh, notice I took a sine from this term here and a sine from this term here. Now, your goal is to get tangent. Now, here's what I'm thinking, see if this makes sense, students. I know tangent equals sine over cosine. So, I've got a sine right here. Now, watch this. If this is sine, and somehow in this parentheses over here, I can make this whole parentheses become 1 over cosine, then look what I have. I have sine over 1 times 1 over cosine. That's sine over cosine. That's tangent. So I'm not for sure, but... When I was working this out a second ago, I said to myself, really, I want to make this whole thing right here become 1 over cosine, and it worked. So I'm looking here, and I've got, okay, I've got two terms. I want to make them 1. I've got sine squared here. So what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to take this sine squared. Excuse me, not sine squared. I'm going to take this secant x, and instead of having the secant x, I'm going to put 1 over cosine. Now here's why I did that. Watch. Now I can put this over 1 and multiply these together. So watch what I have. Cosine x plus sine squared over sine squared times 1 is sine squared and 1 times cosine is cosine. Now watch. Put this over 1 and now get a common denominator. This really might work. Okay. I'm surprised. So I already have a denominator of cosine here. If I take this fraction over here and multiply the top and the bottom by cosine, then I'll have a denominator over here of cosine. So I'm going to multiply the top of this fraction by cosine. That gives me cosine squared. But if, if I do that, I must also multiply the bottom of this fraction here by cosine. So I took this fraction right here, students, and I multiply the top and the bottom by cosine. Okay? Now, I have a common denominator. So, sine of x, and then look what I have up top. Cosine squared x plus sine squared x all over cosine x. And we all know what sine squared plus cosine, or cosine squared plus sine squared is. That's just 1. So I have what I needed. I have sine over 1 times 1 over cosine. And so I get sine over cosine, which is tangent, which is exactly what I wanted, okay? All right, moving on to number 25. Number 25. Okay, students, here we go on number 25. This is going to be a tough one. I just finished working this out. There's a lot of, def a lot of definitely uh, some difficult steps here, but here we go. Uh, the first thing I notice is on the left side here I have two terms and on the right side over here I have one term and so what I'm going to do is something that's pretty long but it needs to be done so it takes some, uh, takes some really good notes here uh, cosine theta cotangent theta over 1 minus sine theta minus now remember when you have a 1 anything over itself is 1 so for 1 right here I'm going to put 1 minus sine theta over 1 minus sine theta. Now that's okay because 
uh, 1 minus sine theta over 1 minus sine theta is the same thing as 1. Now I have a common denominator. So I'm going to put my two fractions together. And remember, the whole reason I'm doing this, my goal is to get this entire left side over here down to one term cosecant theta. And it's not going to be easy to do, but that's my goal. So next, I'm going to have cosine theta cotangent theta minus, now be careful, please, uh, students, please be careful here, it's minus this whole numerator right here, okay? So, you're subtracting this entire numerator, so it's going to be minus 1 plus sine theta. Look at that again, you're, you're subtracting the 1, so it's minus 1, and you're subtracting a negative sign, so it's a positive sign, okay? All over 1 minus sine. Now, uh, remember students, if I go too fast, just uh, pause, the, pause the video and, and uh, I'll watch that again, okay? So I'm going to uh, do a little erasing there to create some space. And here we go. Now, okay, I've got to get this, this numerator up here down to one term somehow. And so here's what I'm going to do. Where this cotangent is right here, I'm going to get rid of this cotangent if I'm able to. And instead of having cotangent there, I'm going to put this over 1. And for cotangent, I'm going to put cosine theta over sine theta. Now, I, and I warned you guys this is a very long problem, OK? But watch this carefully. Cosine over 1 times cosine over sine gives me cosine squared theta over sine theta. Now I know this is a pain of a problem, I get that, but watch carefully what I do next, okay? Now watch this. My whole numerator here, if I could put all of this together into one term, that would be a huge help. So for, uh, for one right here, instead of having a one, I'm going to put sine over sine. Now, Mr. Earhart, why did you do that? I did that because my denominator over here is 1. And if I can get sine right here, I can put these two fractions together. Now, for sine theta over 1, if I multiply the top of this fraction by sine and the bottom of this fraction by sine, I'll get sine squared over sine. I can do that to get a common denominator. So I'm going to take sine theta, and I'm going to multiply it by sine over sine. So what I'm doing basically is taking this fraction here and multiplying it by sine over sine. Now let's see what we get here. We should get sine squared over sine. Now, I have three fractions up top here. They all have sine in the denominator. So look what I have. I have cosine squared minus sine plus sine squared. So cosine squared minus sine plus sine squared all over sine all over 1 minus sine theta. Now students look what I have right here. I have cosine squared plus sine squared. I know there's a, I know there's a sine right there but if I rearrange these terms up top here I would have sine squared plus cosine squared. So really well, I'm going to leave it like this, do this. Really for cosine squared and sine squared, now, now don't miss this here, students. Your sine right here is still negative, okay? It's still negative, but I can put a 1 because what I did just have was sine squared plus cosine squared. So now I have 1 minus sine theta over sine all over 1 minus sine theta over 1. I could put this denominator over 1. So now what I have to do is take this bottom fraction, flip it, and multiply it times the top. And when we do that, we're going to be totally finished with the problem. Okay, watch carefully. To which I'm sure you're cheering that we're finally done. It's a tough problem, and I understand that. All right, now let's take this fraction here, and we're going to flip it and multiply it times the top. So my 1 will go up top, and my 1 minus sine goes in the bottom. All right. 
Now I think I made a mistake somewhere, which probably is my. Hold on one second. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're gonna pull this right here. Oh, I know that's right. Okay, hold on one second. All right, so I think what's happening there is that 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 white um, pencil that I used is uh, coming back when I move this. So I'm gonna leave it right here. My numerator is one minus sine theta over sine times. Now take your denominator and flip it. 1 over 1 minus sine theta. And look, 1 minus sine theta cancels with 1 minus sine theta. 1 times 1 is 1. Sine times 1 is sine. And 1 over sine is cosecant theta, which totally matches this side here, which is what you want. Now, obviously, whoever wrote this book had way too much free time on their hands, OK? This is a really tough problem, but that is how you would do it, OK? All right, moving on to number 29. Okay, number 29 will be a little bit of a breather for us, hopefully. Uh, remember, anytime you have 90 minus theta or pi over 2, which is the same thing as 90, you can substitute your co-function identity in for that, for that function. So if I have tangent of 90 minus theta, that's the exact same thing as cotangent of theta. If, if you want to see that, you can turn your books to page 628 and you will see, uh, see that under the co-function identities, okay? So tangent of a pi over 2 minus theta equals cotangent of theta. So this becomes this and then bring down your tangent theta. And now cotangent is the same thing as 1 over tangent. So I really have 1 over tangent times tangent over 1. Of course, uh, those would cancel. And 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 over 1 is 1. All right, so that was a pretty easy one there. So they had a little mercy on us here on number 29. All right, number 33. OK, let's see if we can figure this one out here. OK, students, on number 33. Uh, the first thing we need to do is probably get rid of those negative thetas because you do not want to uh, try to ver uh, verify a trig identity when you have uh, some of the trig functions having theta and some of the trig functions having negative theta. So if you look at your trig identities, your basic uh, fundamental trig identities, you'll see that we have the identities called the even and, uh, even and odd identities. And if you'll look, Cosine of negative theta is the exact same thing as cosine theta. It's right there in your identity, students. And then if you'll look at sine of negative theta, you'll see this right here. Sine of negative theta equals negative sine theta. So I've got to put 1 minus sine theta for this right here. Okay, well, excuse me, I'm, I'm not putting 1 minus sine theta for that. I'm putting negative sine theta for this, okay? Now that I've done that, remember usually, not always, but usually it's easier to take two terms and turn them into one term than taking this one fraction over here and splitting it up into two. So I'm going to stick with that philosophy here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to take these two terms over here and combine them into one. So what I have is uh, secant is 1 over cosine and tangent is sine over cosine. That's nice because they already have a common denominator. So since they already have a common denominator, I'm going to go ahead and put them together. I get 1 plus sine theta over cosine theta. Now, bring this fraction down. We don't do this too often, but we can definitely do it when we need to. Uh, nothing wrong with using both sides at the same time. Look at this. You have to learn to recognize the students. Remember, whenever two fractions are equal, you can cross multiply and set your products equal. You know that from middle school math, okay? So if I cross multiply here, I get cosine squared. And if I cross multiply here, well, I got 1 times 1, 1 times sine, negative sine times 1, negative sine times uh, sine. You end up getting this. If you'll do all that work and simplify, you'll get 1 minus sine squared. Well, we're finished. 
we all know by now that 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared. So I have cosine squared equals cosine squared. And we're done. Just two more to do from this section, okay? Uh, number 37. Okay, students, here we go with number 37. This will be definitely a challenging problem. I just finished working it out, so we'll see how we do here. Let me get a drink here real quick. And here we go. <clears throat> now, again, students, understand, usually it's easier to take two terms and put them together, but there's going to be exceptions, and I tried it that way. I wasn't seeing a whole lot of success. So I noticed over here I have... Um, my tangent and cotangent up top and my tangent and cotangent in the bottom. I'm like, you know, maybe if I write all of these with a fraction up here, uh, sine over cosine and cosine over sine, and do the same thing down here in the denominator, maybe I could then do some uh, flipping and multiplying or something like that. So here's what I did. For my tangent x right here, I wrote sine x over cosine x. Now let me point out to you guys, notice here we have two different angles. We have x and y. So be really careful when you're making substitutions. If you make a substitution for something that has an angle of x, uh, make sure you leave it x. And if you make a substitution for a trig function that has a y, make sure you leave it a y. Okay. Uh, for example, right here, when I substitute sine over cosine for tangent, I used x and x. But right now, when I make a substitution for cotangent, I'm going to have to use y and y. So cotangent is cosine y over sine y. So there, I've substituted this out and this out. Okay, now, in the denominator here for tangent, uh, tangent x, I'm going to put sine x over cosine x. And for cotangent, uh, cotangent y right here, I'm going to put times uh, cosine y over uh, sine y. Now, let's work our way across this way. First of all, in my big denominator here, right here, I can go ahead and multiply those two fractions together. If I do, I would get sine x times cosine y. So sine x cosine y over, well, cosine x times sine y, so cosine x sine y. Now, up here, I'm going to have to get a common denominator. So, I'm going to have to multiply this fraction here by sine y over sine y. Now, why am I using sine y? Because that's what I have right here, and I want to get that into my denominator over here. This fraction here, I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by cosine x. Now, why cosine x? Well, because that's what I have over here in this denominator, and I want to get that over here as part of this denominator. So, I end up with this right here, and it's really confusing, but watch. I end up with sine y sine x over sine y cosine x. plus, and then I have cosine times cosine, so cosine y, and now you're seeing why it's so important to keep your y's and your, your x's in the correct place. Very important, okay? And then we'll take sine y times cosine x, so sine y cosine x. Now we're going to go ahead, clear a little space here like we like to do, move this over here if at all possible. Now, don't lose sight of the trees for the forest here. The reason we got a common denominator is to put these two fractions together. So now I have sine y sine x plus cosine y cosine x over sine y cosine x all over this right here. Now that actually looks uh, really messy, but it's really awesome because now what I can do is I can take my top fraction 
and multiply it by the bottom fraction as long as I first flip that bottom fraction. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take this fraction here, move it over here. And I know students, I move a lot of stuff around and you can't do that on your paper. So if I'm going too fast, just pause the video. But times, and now we're going to flip this fraction. So this right here will go in the numerator, of course. And this right here will go in the denominator. All right. And now look what happens, students. Look, you have sine y cosine x sine y cosine x. So this cancels with this, okay? And you're left with, and we're kind of running out of room here, students. I apologize. Let's see. We would have all of this times 1, so really just this right here, and all of this times 1. So really what we end up with is your numerator here over your denominator here. Now does that help a whole lot? I hope so. I hope we've not made a little mistake somewhere in which we have to basically start over because I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but here we go. Notice I have two terms up top and one term in the bottom. So I can split this up into two terms. I can quickly say sine y, sine x, over sine x cosine y and then my plus sign goes right here and then cosine y cosine x over sine x cosine y and now look what cancels sine x cancels with uh, sine x leaving you with sine y over cosine y plus look at this cosine y cancels with cosine y leaving you with cosine x over sine x and guys we're finally done what is sine over cosine they're both they're both y's so sine y over cosine y would be tangent y plus cosine x over sine x would be cotangent x wow that was a tough problem there we go one more and we're finally done Well, I cannot believe they did this to us. I paused the video and looked at this, and it's so obvious what to do immediately. They left us with a very, very easy one for our last one, so I'm very thankful uh, to the writers of the book for this last problem here. It's very simple, but here we go. If you'll look at your basic trig identities, your uh, co-function identities, if we have cosine 90 minus, and we're just going to call these x's for right now to make it to make it a little easier, but if we had cosine 90 minus x, that's the same thing as sine. Well, it works for squared too, so cosine squared 90 minus x would be sine squared x. And then bring everything else down. And we are finished. Whew, that was a nice one. These are the kinds right here you hope that I give you on the test or quiz, which I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to do, but sine squared plus cos cosine squared is 1, and 1 equals 1. There we go. All right, continuing on. Okay, students, here we go. We're looking now at page number 624, uh, number 107. And let's see what the directions say to do. The directions say to evaluate the expression without the aid of a calculator. Okay, here we go. Uh, first of all, remember when you're looking at an arc sine problem, that's the same thing as sine of theta equals negative one-half. All right, now, uh, let's see here. Remember when you're dealing with arc sine, that means you're dealing with either quadrant uh, one or four. And so we have a sine of an angle, and when we take sine of that angle, we get out of negative one-half, so we know we're in this quadrant right here. So, there we go. Now remember, when you find theta, it has to be greater than or equal to negative 90 and less than or equal to 90. All right, so there we go. Now, it does say in the directions to, uh, to solve this without the aid of a calculator, so we have to think of our special triangles. 
Now the only triangle I can think of that has a 1 and a 2 would be our 30, 60, 90 triangle. So very quickly, I'm going to draw that. Uh, this is 2, this is 1, this is square root of 3. So I want an angle in which when I take sine of that angle, I get opposite over hypotenuse 1 half. So it would be 30 because the sine of 30 is opposite 1 over hypotenuse 2. So the angle I want here is 30 degrees. Now, here's the problem. You guys have really been taught well to do this, to start here and go to your hypotenuse. And that's normally true, guys. Look, please listen to me. If the original problem had not been written as an arc sign, like this problem is, if I had just given you this problem right here, then the answer would be 330 degrees. I have no problem with that. But the original problem was written as an arc, arc sign, which tells us that our theta has to fall between these two numbers here, greater than negative 90 and less than 90. So we can't use 330. So we have to go the other direction like this. Hold on one second. We have to go this direction here and make it negative 30. So on the test, Coming up, if you were to put 330 for an answer, 330 degrees, I would give you partial credit, but you would still lose points because your theta, because you're dealing with an arc sine, your theta must fall between these two numbers here. So theta would have to equal negative 30 degrees. All right, moving on to number 109. Now, okay, we're trying to find an, an angle here that when we take the cosine of it, we get square root of 3 over 2. Now, uh, when we take the cosine of that angle, notice we're getting a positive square root of 3 over 2. Now, cosine, don't forget when you're dealing with arc, arc cosine, uh, cosine is dealing with quadrant 1 and quadrant 2. Okay, arc sine and arc tangent deal with quadrant 1s and quadrant 4. Okay, quadrant quadrants 1 and 4. Arc cosine is dealing with quadrants 1 and 2. Alright, so with that in mind, I know I'm in quadrant 1 because I'm looking for an angle that when I take cosine of that angle, I get a positive square root of 3 over 2. So I know I'm in this quadrant here. And now I'm trying to think of a special triangle that has square root of 3 and 2. Well, obviously, that's going to be again my 30, 60, 90 triangle. So 30, 60, 90. This is 2, this is 1, this is square root of 3. Now, I want an angle that when I take the cosine of the angle, I get adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, students, that's going to be 30 because the cosine of 30 is adjacent square root of 3 over hypotenuse 2. So my angle inside the triangle would be 30, and that would be my answer. Now, in this case here, just so you know, whenever you're looking for theta or the missing angle and you're dealing with arc cosine, in this case, theta has to be... Uh, let's see, greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 180 degrees. So please don't forget that. Okay, it's very important that you know that. All right, so theta would be 30 degrees because your theta has to fall between uh, these two angles right here, 0 and 180. Okay, all right, moving on to number 111. Okay, cosine uh, inverse cosine of negative 1. Now whenever you see inverse cosine like this, students were still dealing with this is the exact same thing as an arc cosine, okay? It really is the exact same thing. So cosine of negative 1 means inverse cosine of negative 1. So we're still looking for theta here, okay? In such a way that we get out negative 1. So here we go. We're looking for an angle that when we take cosine of that angle we get negative 1. Well cosine because we're dealing with inverse cosine. Remember students inverse cosine is treated the exact same way as arc cosine. So we know we're in either quadrant 1 or quadrant 2 and we know theta has to fall between 0 and 180 degrees or 0 and pi if you're in radians. So wow None of our special triangles ever use 1 unless you're doing with tangent. And don't forget that tangent is the only exception. Tangent of 45 degrees is 1. 
okay but other than tangent anytime you have one or zero or undefined you're usually looking at an axis angle or we call it a quadrant angle okay so with that in mind I know that the only angle that's going to give me negative one when I take cosine of that angle is either going to be zero or 90 or 180 so I know it said to not use a calculator but in this case here I have given you guys permission to use your calculators I have not made you memorize these quadrant angles okay so I'm grabbing my calculator now very quickly and I'm going to try the cosine of zero and that gave me one cosine of 90 gives me zero and the cosine of 180 gives me negative one there it is so the cosine of 180 degrees gives me negative one so theta equals 180 or if you wanted your answer in pi uh, in ratings excuse me theta would be pi there we go okay all right moving on to numbers uh, number 113 we are going to use a calculator and students notice it's arc cosine so right away I know I'm looking for cosine of an angle that gives me 0.324 let's go ahead and find our answer I'm not sure what the directions say let me get a drink here real quick whether they want us to um, uh, find our answer in degrees or radians we're gonna go ahead and do both so you can practice so degrees and radians now take your calculator and I'm going to start off first in degrees so make sure you're in the mode of degrees which I am and now I'm going to hit because I'm looking for an angle here I'm going to hit second cosine so second cosine then 0.324 enter and you're going to get this 71.09 so I'm going to put 71.1 degrees okay now for radians go back to your mode make sure you're in radians and then come out of that hit second cosine and then 0.324 hit enter and you're going to get uh, this for your radians 1.2408 so 1.241 and there we go uh, those are pretty simple you don't want to miss those on the test okay just calculator problems all right moving on to number 125 let's see the directions say find the exact value okay so we're going to find the exact value now uh, be careful on these don't just assume uh, because you see here students uh, arc sine and then sine here that your answer will be this right here that quite often does work but not always so make sure okay okay here we go so I'm going to start on the inside here and I'm going to write sine of theta equals point seven two alright and we could we of course can say point seven two over one if we want to okay no problem there so I know that I'm looking for an angle that when I take sine of it I get a positive point seven two so I'm dealing with quadrant number one put my theta here so opposite is point seven two and hypotenuse is one there so I've drawn my triangle so I, I use this information right here which is this information right here to set up my triangle so now that I have a triangular representation of theta okay and now that I've done that I just simply move to the outside here and I take the sign of what I have drawn here well the sign of theta is opposite over hypotenuse so you get the exact same answer 0.72 over 1 so in this case here sine arc sine of 0.72 gave me 0.72 now some teachers like to teach this in a memorization way if you memorize a domain and range you know when to just put this number and when not to it's, I'm not a huge fan of memorization I would much rather have you quickly uh, draw the triangle and understand what you're doing than to memorize a bunch of facts and then possibly sometimes forget those facts okay so if you'll do it this way every time you'll be fine okay uh, moving on to number 127 all right here we go arc tangent tangent of pi so here we go we're going to start on the inside first of all and we're going to find the tangent of pi okay or in other words the tangent 
of 180 if you prefer degrees okay so we're gonna start on the inside and let's see what we get tangent make sure I'm in the right mode here make sure you're in the right mode here we go tangent of 180 if you're in degrees is zero so here's what I've done now watch how this works a lot of time again students well let me finish the problem I want to show you something about this problem now uh, we're starting on the inside here so tangent of 180 or tangent of pi or tangent of 180 is zero so this whole uh, part of the problem here became zero so now I have arc tangent of zero which means tangent of some angle equals what zero now remember uh, students ta arc tangent means I'm dealing with quadrant one and four and anytime I'm trying to find the tangent of an angle that gives me a zero or undefined, it's going to be one of my axis angles or my quadrant angles. So remember, theta, when you're dealing with arc tangent students, theta has to be between negative 90 and 90. So I'm going to use either 90 or zero or come down this way and put negative 90. So I'm going to grab my calculator real quick. I'm going to try tangent of 90 and I get nothing it doesn't work tangent of zero gives me a zero so that works and then tangent of negative 90 gives me undefined again so tangent of zero gives me zero so theta equals zero so look a lot of students who try to take shortcuts would have seen arc tangent tangent and just thought their answer was pi and in a way they're right because it's true if you take your calculator real quick and type in the tangent of 180 you will get zero that's true theta could be 180 but it can't be because you're dealing with arc tangent and arc tangent has a domain it's limited and remember it's limited between negative 90 and positive 90 and 180 does not fall in that area okay so just like the last problem even though it was backwards you had sine arc sine and this problem was arc tangent tangent quite often your answer will be just this number here like it was back here but not always so I would encourage you to work these out take your time draw your triangles and make sure you're really checking your work okay so let's quickly review this again tangent of the tangent of pi or 180 is zero so this whole part of the problem here became zero so now I have arc tangent of zero which means tangent of theta equals zero well, I've got to find theta that when I take tangent of that angle, I get zero. Well, it's got to fall somewhere in this area right here between negative 90 and 90. And the answer is zero, okay? All right, let me get a drink here. Moving on to 129. Okay, here we go, 129. Uh, let's see here. Okay, on the inside, we're going to start off with tangent of theta equals 3 fourths, okay? So tangent is either in this quadrant here or this quadrant here. And because I'm dealing with a tangent of theta giving me out a positive 3 fourths, I know I'm in this quadrant here. So here's theta, opposite over adjacent, and the hypotenuse would be 5, using Pythagorean's theorem, of course. So with that in mind, now I've taken arc tangent, I've rewritten it like this, and now I've taken this and I've got a visual triangular representation of what theta is. So now I can take the cosine of theta. And the cosine of theta will be adjacent over hypotenuse. And cosine in this quadrant here is positive. So my answer would be 4 fifths. Okay? Look that over. Make sure you understand that. Moving on to number 131. All right. Now, we're dealing with arc tangent. Okay? So tangent of theta would be 12 fifths okay so let's get a triangular representation of theta here there we go here's theta we have opposite over um, adjacent now Pythagorean's theorem that would be 144 plus 25 that'd be 169 the square root of 169 would be 13 so this would be 13 and I got that of course from using Pythagorean's theorem students and now I took this information here, I wrote a tangent of theta, then I took this information, I got a triangular uh, representation, a picture of what theta is, and now take the secant of theta. 
So the secant of theta would be, of course, secant is positive in this quadrant. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So secant would be hypotenuse over adjacent. So hypotenuse is 13 and adjacent would be 5. So there we go. The secant of theta would be hypotenuse over adjacent positive 13 over 5. Okay. All right, moving on to number 133. 133, here we go. The height of a radio transmission tower is 70 meters, so here we go, 70 meters. And it casts a shadow of length 30 meters, so this is 30. So we have a, we have a right triangle here. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, students. Uh, we have a right triangle, so that's 30. This is 70. And so it says, find the angle of elevation of the sun. Okay, angle of elevation to the sun. Now think about it. If the if the shadow is going this way, there's no way, students, the sun is over here. Okay, the sun has to be here. My great drawing skills hitting the tower and casting a shadow this way. Okay, so when when they say to find the angle of elevation to the sun. Don't forget that means you have to have a horizontal line on the ground like we have here. And then even though my son's not really drawing the best place, I'll admit that. Really, I should probably uh, go like, hold on one second, this thing's not working. All right, here, hold on. Okay, students, I'm back here. had a little crash of the computer there. But anyways, let's continue on. So what I was saying is, is really... Hopefully you understand, if you continue to draw this line going upward, what you're going to hit is the sun, okay? So that's what I was trying to show you. So we have this here is 70, okay? And this is 30. So when you're being asked to find the angle of elevation, remember an angle of elevation or an angle of depression is always drawn with a horizontal line. Well, you've already got your horizontal line here. And then here's the slanted line going up, hitting the sun. So the angle of elevation is really just this angle right here. That's it. And so this can be done pretty easily. We have a right triangle. Okay, right here's our right angle. Hopefully, if, if the tower was built stable and straight up and down, we have a right angle here. And so here's the angle I'm looking for. And based on this angle here, this side over here is called opposite, and this one's called adjacent. So I've got this. I've got tangent of theta equals opposite over adjacent. Okay, so with my calculator, because I'm looking for an angle, I'm going to hit second tangent. If I can get my calculator not to fall off my lap here, tangent, second tangent, 70 divided by 30, enter, and I'm going to get 66.8 degrees. So you're welcome to put that for your answer if you want. The angle of elevation is 66.8, or you can put just 67 degrees. Okay, wherever you went around is up to you. All right, so there we go. And moving on to uh, the next problem. Here we go. Okay, 134. Okay, the problem reads as follows. Your football is leaned at the edge of the roof of your school building where you are uh, 25, uh, 25 feet from the base of the building. The angle of elevation to your football is 21 degrees. How high off the ground is your football? Okay, well, let's just draw uh, lines and points to make it easier. So here's the ground. Here's your school. And here's the edge of the building where the football is. Okay, you're 25 feet away, so you're about right here. Let's say just, we don't really care if our drawing is drawn perfectly to scale. That's not the end of the world. So 25 feet from the school, okay? And it's, uh, it says... The angle of elevation is 21 degrees from where you're at up to the football. So here's your horizontal ground. You always need a horizontal line to draw an angle of elevation or depression. Okay, so there's your horizontal line. And now draw the angle going up to your football. And don't ask me how you knew this. Okay, but you, you supposedly know this is 21 degrees. And so this is your right angle right here. Okay, now they simply want to know how high off, how high off the ground is your football. So we're looking for this height right here. So students, we have an angle here based, we have a right triangle based on this angle here, we have an opposite and an adjacent. So I would simply write 
the tangent of 21 degrees equals opposite over adjacent, so x over 25, multiply both sides by 25, 25 tangent of 21 equals x. So very quickly with my calculator, make sure I'm in degrees here of course, make sure you're in degrees students, and I am, so 25 tangent of 21, that's the wrong button, let's see, try this again, 25 tangent of 21 degrees would be 9.59 or 9.6 feet. I'm kind of laughing at my drawing. There's no way mine's drawn to scale, okay? But that's okay. It's really not a big deal. As long as you get a good, solid picture of what you're looking at, that's definitely sufficient, okay? All right, moving on to 135. And let's see how we do on this. Here we go. 